So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Grover. I'm one of the co-CEOs of PCS Adventures. Todd Hackett, the other CEO, is also online with us and he'll be available to answer some questions here as well. Um, I'm located in Boise, Idaho. Todd is in Muscatine, Iowa. And uh, so we won't have video from Todd, but you'll be able to hear him and uh, he's online so he can answer any questions you might have. So today I wanted to start with an introduction to PCS. Um, we have our investor relations uh, manager, um, Ty Jacobson, right here with us as well. Hey guys, Stock Doc here with you. And what we're going to do is go through a brief PowerPoint presentation that just gives you the basic fundamentals of the company, talk a little bit about the products, we have a number of examples here, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A and let uh, um, Ty ask some questions and basically facilitate our conversation from there. So to begin, let's go ahead and take a look at um, a couple of slides here. Uh, PCS Adventures, company that's been around a long time. Uh, we actually um, originated back in the late 80s. Um, it was founded by a school teacher, a, wild, um, a rural school teacher that was really fascinated by hands-on experiential education. And a lot of the things that uh, that man developed back then in the 80s, we still do today. Um, a lot of the methods and the approaches were genuinely exciting and engaging for students. They're very unique. Some of the things that you'll see today um, are outshoots of what uh, Pat McShane, the original founder, came up with back then. So, um, at the core of PCS, what is it we do? Well, we make children's lives better through en engaging education experiences. And we do that in a number of ways. So some of the products and programs we'll talk about today, you'll see how that actually takes place. Now, it might be us training a teacher to make their classroom more exciting and engaging. It might actually be a product we develop that students get to work with hands-on. It might be curriculum that we create. It might be software we create or hardware. You'll get to see a little bit of all of those things. Uh, PCS has a rich base of technology and intellectual property, all focused on developing engaging learning experiences, because that's one of the keys to successful education. If you can get a student excited, they're going to want to learn. So our mission is to take what we do, um, engaging kids with education, and improve the lives of 10 million kids a year. Okay, so we want to reach 10 million kids through our products, through our services, through our licenses, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And you'll get to see a few examples as well in this PowerPoint to some of the places that PCS is working around the globe. The way that we're going to get to those 10 million kids, uh, we're going to become a leader in K-12 robotics education. We already have been a technology leader now for a year and a half, um, coming into the market first with tablet-based robotics programming. Um, we have some of the best robotics um, development curriculum and um, software and hardware on the market today because it's so versatile. You'll get to see a little bit of that as we go through. We'll show you some of our products. Another thing that we're doing is taking STEM products into every elementary classroom in the country. One of the major pain points of principals around the country, and there's, there's over 60,000 elementary schools in the United States, one of their major pain points is getting their teachers more comfortable with science and engineering and technology. Um, most elementary teachers, not all of them, but many of them are more comfortable with language arts and softer areas. So when you start introducing robotics or electronics or engineering, they naturally get a little bit um, they get a little bit um, hesitant. They're not quite confident in what they're doing in STEM areas. We've developed specific products that have university research that supports their success that help those teachers become more comfortable. Um, the product that we'll show you that does that is called Brick Lab, and it's one of my favorites. Um, Ty's pretty excited about it too. Um, another thing that we're working on to get to those 10 million people, establishing a global network of adventures labs. We're actually standing in an adventures lab right here. It is a hands-on experiential learning environment where kids can actually get to build. They design robots, they build bridges, they create software, they write programming games, they write um, um, stories, they do video production, they do all kinds of things in these labs. And they're designed again to make that engaging educational experience come to life for people. So Adventures Labs around the world, we'll show you what some of them look like in India, we'll show you what some of them look like here. Um, the last piece of this, which ties all of the products, services, labs, everything together, is what we call a virtual community of experiential learners. Now that's the big, big kahuna that we are pursuing is the scalable software virtual subscription model that will tie all of these people together that are working within our services. 
So what's different about PCS and our virtual learning? Because there's lots of virtual learning providers out there. Our focus is a little different. We have our own blue ocean of experiential learning as a focus. Um, doing experiential hands-on education and facilitating it with online tools. We call this blended learning. Research shows it's by far the most effective way to get kids excited and actually get the learning to stick. So that's what we focus on. That's where we're different than everybody else. And that's how we're going to build this global network of experiential learners. So, a couple of things here. Um, PCS STEM expertise is the underlying foundation. STEM, for those of you who might be new to the education acronym, is science, technology, engineering, and math. And our STEM expertise, really, the, the revenues from the company comes from three different buckets. One is the STEM products, things that we sell into the school market, things like our programming environment that you see here that is coupled with robotics kits, with um, things like robot arms, things like our brick lab parts, the kids actually do curriculum around. So more IQ. Yeah, this is, this is great, guys. All right, so this is one of the products that actually targets the retail market, which is bucket number three. So if you look at the three revenue streams that the company generates, we've got school products, which are combined with curriculum to go into the classroom. We've got home products, things like the robotics that we take the same technology and the same um, software and that you can do it right in the household. And then the third piece is international, where we take, again, all of this expertise and a lot of it is custom uh, consulting and work that we do to help other countries develop STEM solutions that they can take to their schools. So those are the three buckets of the company. Yeah, because it's a, it's a worldwide demand, right? Exactly. Not everybody's speaking English. Mm -hmm. So you guys are actually working to convert everything over to, say, Arabic or um, uh, all sorts of other different uh, languages and different cultures so that they can all adapt and use STEM or STEAM uh, curriculum in their schools, too. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the challenge with a lot of what we do is exactly that. It's localization. So the curriculum that we write here may have to be localized for cultural values or religious differences. We partner closely with organizations in those host countries to make sure that that's done properly. So for example, the large project that we're implementing in Saudi Arabia, um, all of the translation, localization, even design um, for the Arabic side has been done in a country over there. Packaging. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah, in fact, uh, we have retail packaging that's uh, in Arabic that we'll actually have out for people to see soon. Uh, we've got some interesting things going on overseas to take some of the retail products um, out into the marketplace as well as the curriculum products we've been talking about. Um, the slide that I have up right now is an intro to some of the products. We're going to go through those quickly because we're already pointing out some of them and I know Ty wants to get to some questions here fairly quickly. So, well, I mean, it's, we're, in a, we're in a toy store right now. I mean, I'm excited, <laughs> right? So first product, and this is uh, called Brick Lab. Brick Lab, if you'll look at it closely here, you'll notice it looks like um, Lego bricks, and they're compatible with Lego, but they're a little different. Um, this is a special brick that we've developed over the years. Um, for our programs, things like the Brick Lab curriculum that we develop and install into classrooms, we write activities that are specifically aligned with um, you know, colors, sizes. You need a very specific inventory. So we created this inventory, and over the years we've used all the different types of bricks that are out there. We started with Lego, we've used Mega Blocks, um, Connex makes a block that we've used. Um, there are a couple of Chinese brands we've tried. Ultimately, we ended up going um, to Korea to create our own manufacturing solution, and these are our own proprietary brick, which the clutch strength on them is a little bit stronger than Lego, so they stick together a little bit more for actual curriculum activities. Some of the other attributes, which Ty was pretty excited about, you've got rounded corners, so there's a little bit of separation between the bricks. The corners are a little bit rounded, so when you step on them at night without your shoes, yeah. they're not quite as painful. Yeah. They still hurt, but not just, as bad. If I can just say a couple of words about this, guys. Um, you know, the, the Lego bricks themselves are a great brick, but, I mean, this brick here is just a little bit better. I mean, that rounded corner that Robert's talking about, um, makes it so that if you went into that bucket, which they don't make anymore, uh, of Legos, you're not going to, you know, get your hands all uh, cut up and that stepping on it barefoot in the middle of the night walking down the hallway. 
um, and the clutch strength is better, so you can do some more, um, I don't know, practical things with these as far as construction goes. That maybe you can even put some motors and stuff like that on and go fly some Legos. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, and um, again, wh how are you able to do this? How is this not infringement on Lego? Uh, the Lego patent on what they call the stud dressing expired a number of years ago. So that's why Mattel and Kinex and Mega Blocks all have their own mm -hmm. um, Lego compatible solution. And that's, uh, that's why we ended up with the ability to do this. So it wasn't any patent infringement or anything. It was the thought to take something that's already a tremendous tool. I mean, we all love Lego. And we actually created what we consider to be a better version of the brick, um, especially for educational purposes. So somebody is watching this right now and they go, oh yeah, I remember what he just said about those big buckets of Legos and, mm -hmm. I, and I kind of am interested in what PCS has here for their brick. Could they get a hold of these? Is this something that you offer? You can buy those uh, in tubs that contain about 7,000 bricks right now online. We also have a Brick Lab at Home that's available that uh, is on our website. So yeah, those are available. And uh, we're talking about doing some other more consumer-oriented packages that would add to our retail line. So right now we have um, several retail products out that range from um, uh, storage devices that are uh, little bracelets for kids to t-shirts to robotics to engineering kits. We'll be adding on additional products that include things like the bricks and other things that, are, that we're very excited about in the future. Well, we all know how well that Lego has done with their bricks, so uh, there's no doubt that you'll probably do exceedingly well with your own. We like to think so. We're excited about it. As am I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so next slide. We've talked a little bit about Brick Lab. The picture on the uh, slide there is actually what one of these tubs looks like, and then there's a bunch of curriculum samples that you can see laying around there. Discover Engineering. I'm going to go through these quickly. Discover Engineering, Discover Robotics. The school products that I was going to show you, um, Discover Robotics, Discover Engineering. Um, engineering and hands-on um, design and building are one of the core things that we really work on because it's a natural enabling platform for kids to learn. There's nothing like robotics that integrates you know, things like computer programming, electronics, mechanical engineering, structural engineering. Um, this model right here is a perfect example of that. This is a, um, one of the products that we use in Saudi Arabia with um, a system that we've created that's being deployed in science centers uh, throughout the kingdom. And this is what we call advanced robotics. Advanced robotics um, is not just building with you know, these simple manipulatives that we use to get kids started on mechanical engineering. Advanced robotics has all kinds of um, capabilities in terms of a vehicle like this that you can program to be autonomous. It can gather data, it can send signals back, collect data for you, um, basically assembling you know, information from sensors that are on board. This one actually has solar panels built into it, so that can augment its, um, uh, basically the distance it can go. Uh, we use all of those as teaching tools to teach kids about all of those principles of engineering. Um, one of the things also that we've done that's the step up beyond this is something that Ty is also very excited about, drones. So if we look at the progression of engineering and robotics, we start kids at the elementary level with something very simple, beginning to teach them the design process, teaching them how to solve problems, think outside the box. And ultimately, when they get up into the high school level, this is the kind of things that they are working on. Much more sophisticated. They're not Lego bricks. They're actual racing drones that have full video capabilities. Um, there's kind of a... Um, major sensation going on right now around the world. It's called FPV. It stands for First Person Video, which um, they use in drone racing. So you can actually, Ty is simulating it here, if you look on this drone you'll notice there's a camera right on the front. The camera feed is coming and is sending it wirelessly back to the goggles so that basically Ty is sitting in the cockpit of this drone and can steer it. Now there are tremendous things that you can do with this besides it just being a lot of fun. You can actually teach all kinds of things um, related to aviation, to electronics, to advanced robotics. Um, the uses of drones are you know, remarkable in terms of all of the industries that they're starting to pop up in. Yeah, ahead, it's just, it's incredible, yeah. I mean, like Robert's saying, um, and, and this drone in particular would go about, what, 60 miles an hour or so? About 60 miles an hour, so, yeah, full speed. Yeah, 
Um, it, it's, it's insane. It's like you're sitting in the cockpit of it. But um, as Robert was starting to point out, and um, if you care to put any color on the, the, the future of PCS and the drone space um, for people, anything that you have developed there, um, feel free to do so. But uh, you guys can do a quick Google search and you can find out that there's um, so many different possibilities for the use of drones and applications, software, sensors, cameras, everything else like that. And actually, most components that are on a drone are already components that PCS uh, produces and is able to source uh, from China or Korea or elsewhere. Yeah, fortunately we have um, a pretty extraordinary development resource. We have an engineer in, that's actually located in China that does a lot of our design work for us. He also interfaces for us with the local manufacturing communities. So things like injection molding, um, electronic design, um, all of those things we can have done locally there in China and we end up getting remarkable um, prices. We try to leverage the best of the United States in terms of design for software, things like that. When we finally get to the point of manufacturing, uh, to be competitive, we have to go to China, which is where a lot of these things that we're showing you come from, especially like the advanced uh, robotics um, drone, the, the rover that we're showing you. The components for RIQ um, are a mix of things that we actually manufacture in China, as well as uh, materials that come from Germany and a few other places. So we have a global supply chain. We have the ability to leverage engineering expertise and manufacturing in China and bring all of these things to life with really um, you know, very good margins. And we're capable of doing things on a scale that uh, you know, for as small a company as we are, we have resources that are kind of mind-boggling, actually. And with that said, I think, I think that's a pretty good start here. Did, should we open it up to any questions, or you want to go to Todd, or why don't we see if there's any questions that anybody has? Yeah, that's great. While we're waiting, I can do a couple more okay. slides here, and we'll talk about um, two other pieces of the company. You know, we've talked about the products and the technology. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about is the labs. So this is a picture of what an adventures lab looks like. Um, on the slide you can actually see kind of a panorama shot. That's the lab actually we're standing in right now. And all of those subject areas that are listed there um, are the types of activities that we do in the lab. So the curriculum that we create is around electronics, 3D design, uh, 3D printing. There's actually a 3D printer in the lab here, a laser cutting machine. Kids can actually fabricate and design and participate in the actual you know, engineering process. Um, statics, uh, computer programming, a lot of different areas. If you think about it as kind of a smorgasbord of learning, this is where kids can come to actually explore, experiment, and work within what we call our adaptive learning system, called the merit system. And that's where, this is a merit system badge right here. The student, uh, her name is Michaela. She's been with us now for three years. And on the back, it shows her status. Um, you can see some of the colored triangles there. Each one of those represents a subject area that Michaela's been working in. She's one of our top students. Um, some of our girls are our best engineers, actually, because they're, they're very committed and dedicated. And uh, she's worked in almost all of those areas that I was just describing. This approach to education is much different than your traditional classroom. Um, it's very effective because it's very student-centric. And when I say it's adaptive, I mean it literally adapts to a student's preferences, their abilities, how fast they want to learn something, what their interests are. So it's the future of education. We want education to tailor to the individual rather than 30 kids in a box all having to hear the same thing. Adaptive is where um, education is going and needs to go. Um, Fortunately, it's what we've been doing for over 20 years, so we're experts at it. Uh, you know, good point that you brought up there. So PCS has been around for a long time. Would you say that it would be a fair assessment that maybe you guys were just a little bit too early to the game? That's uh, what uh, we've come to the conclusion of on a number of things, yeah. We launched an online learning platform that was all around experiential learning in 1999, and uh, we were way ahead of the curve. Um, the people that were using it were all forward thinkers, but the infrastructure, bandwidth, those things weren't there yet. Really, the, the support of the population at the time, too, right? Yeah. Front page news last week of the Idaho Statesman here was full STEM ahead for education. Mm -hmm. Can you add any color to that and what that, what yeah. that was talking about? Yeah, STEM, again, 
you know, science, technology, engineering, math, major movement um, globally. Federally, um, uh, this country's been working on STEM education since 1999. It really started to come into vogue um, in the year, you know, early 2000s. Uh, the Glenn Commission in 1999 was one of the first um, organized efforts of the, of the uh, federal government to pinpoint some of the problems with our education system and elevated the awareness of the need for science and math um, education to change. So over the past you know, 16 years now, it's really been evolving, and now there are major initiatives at the federal level, state level, local levels, um, multiple corporate um, initiatives trying to get more people involved in STEM education. Uh, we have a statewide STEM initiative, which is what that um, um, Idaho Statesman article was about. Uh, where they're establishing basically centers for STEM excellence, which uh, help propagate STEM, understanding STEM to teachers and the communities. Um, they're following a model in Utah, who we actually work with some of the people in Utah as well. Um, Iowa, which is where uh, Todd Hackett is right now, has a very established STEM network that's a statewide initiative, trying to push STEM out through community colleges, um, getting kids into um, education tracks that will get them into university programs. You know, it's a major thing. Um, not just nationally again, but globally. And that's why we continue to get connections and um, inquiries from overseas, which actually is the next slide. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples here of programs that are going on overseas related to STEM. So we have a group, we call it PCS International, which takes the things that we've been talking about, we tailor them for the international markets. We have a partner in India, for example, that has licensed our curriculum and our content and approaches. Uh, we help facilitate supply chain in India as well. And they take our programs and they drop them into private schools in India. So the pictures on this particular slide actually show kids in classrooms in India that are using our programs. Now again, just like we were talking earlier, those materials need to be localized for India. Um, so they're not identical to what we have. We give them the open license, we show them the methods, and then they tailor them for that culture. So. I believe we're now into about 60 to 70 schools in India. We expect to be well over 100 by next year. Uh, the company that facilitates this for us, who is our close partner, is called CREA, C-R-E-Y-A. Um, you can look up creyalearning.com. They've got a beautiful website with lots of pictures like this that you can see kids in action doing PCS programs. So just uh, real quick, um, how, do you, how do you monetize the, uh, the learning lab? and the kids that are coming in. How does that work for people who aren't familiar with that? So there's different models. In India, it's a per seat model. So um, they basically license the program to a school, and then every student that goes through that lab, you know, not to be crude, but they essentially have a meter on them. Each student has you know, a certain dollar amount that they generate for that license each year. And in India, we have um, pretty good sized schools. A lot of the private schools have two to 3,000 kids in them. So they set these labs up, and then on a weekly basis, kids get to rotate through them. Um, here locally in Boise, we have a lab that we installed at Galileo, um, which is a um, STEM engineering school that's just outside of town. And um, I think we have, do we have a question? Yeah, it relates to this. Okay, let me finish talking yeah. about Galileo. Galileo is an example of, what, of how that works in the public school system here in the United States. They set up a number of different programs like this that kids rotate through on a weekly basis. And then another model is here in this private lab where kids attend for tuition. So they come once a week as if they're attending music lessons. And during that 75 minute period they're here in the lab, they don't study the cello, they study things like robotics and computer programming and structural engineering and things like that. So that's how that works. Uh, please, Sam, tell us, what's the question? Uh, so with regards to the Middle East, when will the revenues start to flow to the company for all of your Middle East initiatives? Uh, it's actually been flowing now for a number of years. You know, we've been working in the Middle East since, well, since the mid 2000s. Um, so things over there are a little different. They move slowly. It takes time to build up relationships. Um, however, all of the time and investment that we've put into that has really started to pay off. I think it was. Three years ago, we did, I think, about $106,000 in consulting um, out of Saudi Arabia. Um, the following year, we did about $600,000. Um, last year, we announced contracts of over a million dollars that are related to developing curriculum, um, designing labs, outreach programs. So the trajectory there, it's growing, and it is an actual performing revenue stream. 
since these are government contracts, they don't pay as fast as we'd like, but uh, it's really, it's reliable because you know they're going to pay. We have good point. Do you, now, do you expect that continued uh, growth curve? Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, because of the time and the investment we've put into the kingdom, you know, we have really strong relationships. The labs that have been designed that are being um, actually utilized overseas, in fact, that we might have a picture of one here. Yeah, this slide right here shows some of the things going on in Middle East. Yeah, I love this. This is the the uh, the labs that you have that are very futuristic for Saudi Arabia, right? Exactly. Yeah. The the picture there at the top of this slide is the bio um, science lab, so biomedical technology. So life sciences. We actually have designed eight different labs for the Science Center initiative in Saudi Arabia, and they include things like aerospace, robotics, engineering. Um, the life sciences, chemistry and nanotechnology, physics, you know, a lot of very exciting topics and the labs have been designed to look like basically the enterprise, you know, it looks like you're walking into a starship when you see one of these labs. And again, the intent is, if you think back to what I talked about when we first started, we're creating engaging educational experiences for kids. So the lab is like a giant piece of STEM candy, if you will. They can't wait to get in there and get their hands on a lot of the exciting things we do. Some of the other contracts that I was mentioning, the van that you see there, uh, that's part of the outreach program. So there's these colorful Mercedes Sprinter vans driving around Saudi Arabia with things like RIQ in them for robotics activities, um, Brick Lab, all of the different programs that we designed are in those um, outreach programs. And those are basically a feeder to get the kids into the science centers, which is the next initiative that we're working on. So yeah, based on what we've been doing, I see us continuing to grow our business there. So these vans are out cruising around right now? Yes. Yep. Right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real van. <laughs> I've got a video that actually shows, well, in fact, I think uh, the picture on the left is a snip out of a video of kids actually doing some of these outreach programs. No kidding. Yeah. That's neat. Well, I hope that that growth continues to be uh, as phenomenal as you've described. Yeah, we're excited about it. Um, you know, internationally there are so many opportunities. Um, we had visitors from China here a month ago um, looking for similar things. You know, around the world people recognize that for education to really change in their countries, they need to get kids thinking outside of the box. And we call these things 21st century skills. It's the ability to communicate, collaborate, um, solve problems, not just um, take tests and regurgitate road answers, we need to teach kids how to think. And, and, and become leaders. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, is there another question? Yes, we have a lot of questions. So. Okay, I got a lot of questions pouring in, guys. Do you expect more contracts from Saudi Arabia in the future? Yes, I think I just answered that. Uh, based on where we're positioned, I would expect more. Um, I can't really specifically say which ones are in the queue and what we're expecting. I can just say that work there is, uh, uh, has been steady and we expect the program to continue growing. Thanks for that question, guys. How come, um, or why do you not have as much revenue as you have in Saudi Arabia here in the United States? We've been um, a development com company, I would say. A lot of the things that you see that we're showing you now are really now coming to fruition. So not as strong on the on the marketing and sales side as we've needed to be. Building our presence in Saudi Arabia took a lot of resources and time. Um, one of the things that we've been working on over the past 18 months is to remedy that. So the new products and services that we've assembled, we've been working closely with a number of groups to expand our sales force, which we've actually over doubled our sales force in the last year. And we're working on partnerships with um, some major channels that should be able to get these unique products into some um, significant sales channels, I think, in the near future. Did that question come in ahead of time to you? Because you did exceptional at that. Sounds like you already have that handled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, we've been working on it. Yeah. So, yeah. Sounds like it. Do you have plans to expand the labs across the United States? Yeah, absolutely. Now, what that model looks like, um, we're not entirely sure yet. So, the um, the labs that we use in India are a perfect example. So we drop those into um, you know, private school classrooms. So 
a mix of our labs. They may end up being in private organizations. They may be in public schools. They may be just like what we're doing here where we have for-profit centers. And you know, one of the things we've been doing with these labs that we've opened here in Boise is a lot of R&D, working with students, working with parents, fine-tuning what the services are that we want to provide and what's going to be scalable. A lot of that goes back to this virtual learning network that I had talked about at the very beginning. Um, that's how we want to reach 10 million customers on an annual basis, is to have that little digital tether that whether they're attending our lab or attending a classroom, um, they're connected to us, they're connected to our network, and we're generating revenue off of yeah, that. Like you have your, build your own ecosystem around it. Exactly. Well, you already That's have, a great word for it. Yeah. You really already have your own ecosystem, especially with Cortex here, guys. If you haven't already done so, and I don't mean to interrupt, go ahead, take a minute tonight and look at uh, Cortex, and uh, this is this is your own development, right? Exactly. This, yes, is, that's our this is on iOS, this is Android, mm -hmm. this is also on PCs and Mac. Yep, it'll run on right? just about anything. We're not to Linux yet, but we've talked about it. Okay. And we're working on Chromebooks. This is a drag and drop feature. It allows you to do so many things that I can't even begin to explain. Um, I did have an RIQ for a short period of time here, and I was able to program it to do some neat things. Um, Cortex, take a look at that really neat. Is there another question? Yes. Uh, how many schools are you currently in in the United States? You know, our primary focus has been after school. Over the last, again, last couple of years, we've started to change that where we developed core curriculum to get into the classrooms. So um, classrooms and the school cycle sales process is very long. You know, the things that we're doing now will result in sales a year from now because that's how school budget cycles work. So that's where a lot of the big money is. That's where the big budgets are is when you get into those hundred plus thousand schools nationwide. On the after school side where we focused because our materials, our experiential learning is very well suited to informal education environments like boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, community learning centers. Um, those kinds of programs were in over 7,000 sites nationwide. So, you know, we've penetrated the after-school market very well. And uh, now the next step is, as I was saying, find those channels to get us out into, you know, deeper waters. I just have a quick question. When you start talking about deeper waters, I'm thinking overseas. I'm thinking, um, is there anything that you can shed light on here? This is my own question that I'm going to just interject. Uh, as far as, like, you're pink right now. You've been pink for a long time, but... You guys have always had current filings uh, for, what, at least a decade, right? Yeah, we've always been current, um, so audited. Why, yeah. So why not QB? Uh, we actually plan to go back to the QB. We've been on the QB, and um, the only reason we're not on it right now is we didn't pay the fees to do that for a while to save some money um, while we've been doing a lot of infrastructure development. But no, the plan is for in, in our next queue is to take us back to the QB and beyond, hopefully one of these days. So yeah, we're very well aware of uh, the ramifications of getting off the pinks, and we're excited to do that. We're excited that, that people are watching us, are gonna be part of that. Yeah, is that something that would be uh, in the near term, or can you give any color to that, or is that? It'll be in the next quarter. So our second quarter starts July 1st, so it'll be before our annual shareholders meeting, which is always in September. Okay, great. More questions? We have quite a few more actually. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll try to speed through these things a little <laughs> bit faster, guys. Uh, so to who and where will you be selling the drones? Uh, right now we're selling the drones to Saudi Arabia and we're taking what we've built in terms of curriculum and then expertise and we're evaluating what we want to do with the drone market next. Oh. Uh, as an investor, why should I invest in your company? Because PCS is the future of education, you know. Um, Ty nailed it. He said, you guys were early. We were ahead of our time. And now we're basically at what, you know, you call it the perfect storm, the perfect storm of variables where we've got the right technology. Uh, we're experts in STEM education, experiential learning, 21st century skills. We're experts in robotics and education. Robotics is the fastest growing industry on the planet right now. Um, it's going to be permeating every industry. And uh, preparing kids for the future means preparing them for um, what robotics is going to look like in the workplace. Whether or not you are a robotic technician or an engineer, 
you're going to be surrounded by environments that include robotics. Um, there's no getting away from it. So really we're perfectly positioned to take all of the expertise and things we've developed over the past two decades and really get them out into those deep waters again. Yeah, all of those, uh, you know, it hasn't always been an easy road, I'm sure, moving forward here. Uh, you guys have probably tripped and fell a number of times and had the opportunity to get those learning lessons from a company standpoint that maybe some of the startup companies that want to emulate what you're doing right now are probably going to have uh, some trouble and trip and fall themselves where you've already made it through that, uh, those, those uh, growing pains, we'll call them. Is that yeah. a pretty fair assessment? I think that's very accurate. Barriers to entry to what we do are very high. A lot of intellectual property is required, expertise, um, technology, access to manufacturing and design. It's very difficult to do what we do. It's not like anybody can just open up a shop on the corner and start doing what we do. So yeah, we have a tremendous, um, we got a tremendous benefit in terms of, you know. You've been doing it a long time, expertise. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, okay. Do you plan to move the company to a higher exchange? Yes, I think we talked about that a little bit. We'll be moving to the QB um, within the next quarter. We're excited about that. All right. uh, the current share structure is extremely tight. Do you have plans on increasing the AS? We've talked about it. Um, it's been the topic of multiple board, mem board meetings. Um, at this point, we've not determined whether we need to or not. Um, it's certainly something that's been discussed, but we don't want to dilute the company. As a board, we're committed to making shareholder value as strong as possible. Having said that, if we have to authorize, it would be for specific purposes of raising capital to expand faster, possibly do acquisitions, partnerships. Uh, we don't dilute lightly. We've been, um, we've been in the basement. Our stock has been, you know, way undervalued. And oh, yeah, it's been... At this point, what we want to do is conserve as much as possible of what uh, you know the company share structure is. I mean, a, a few years ago, when this was trading in the multiple dollar range, the share structure really wasn't too much different then than it is now. Is that correct? Yeah, that's probably I mean, true. You, you probably haven't even doubled your share structure in a decade. Um, we went from 60 to about 85 million shares. We authorized another 30 million shares, I think, two or three years ago. And we've had to use a lot of that to get us through the rough waters here over right. the last three years. So yeah. if that's any testament, I mean, it is to me that if it, it, during that duration of time, that's the only number of shares that have been added mm -hmm. to the company, um, I think that's a pretty good place to start. Perfect. Uh, Todd Hackett has over 30% of insider shares. Can we hear why Todd has bought so many shares on the open market? This would be a great time to go segue over to Todd if yeah. we can. Yeah. All right. So um, Todd is on the line. Todd, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and answer this question, that would be great. You get this question answered directly. Your question is why have I bought so many shares in the open market? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, your reasoning behind why you bought so many shares. I think the I think the stock was undervalued considerably in my opinion and I see enormous upside potential in the future of the company and I think it's going to be good for the shareholders. And there's we have a lot of a lot of things under underway. A lot of the um, heavy lifting so to speak has been done in the developing and so forth, and now we just need to get it out in our distribution channels. Yeah, Todd, this is Ty. I got a quick question for you. Um, if, if you can tell people, how long have you been a shareholder? Um, can you tell the, the viewers, the shareholders here? I was a shareholder in 2007. Okay. How did you get involved with the company? I first saw an article in Kiplinger's that was written back in 2007 and I thought it sounded like a good um, good play on the education space. It was an early stage company and with lots of growth potentials and at that time they were um, talking about overseas growth, a, a tremendous amount of overseas growth 
and it's um, just taking longer to get there. And I think it's going to happen and keep expanding. Okay. Well, Todd, we got lots of questions coming in right now. Is there anything else that you'd like to just add here? Um, like to like to see if we can keep you on the line here for a minute. Are there any but, other uh, specific questions for Todd? Um, he can probably answer this one. Uh, what is the one thing you would want Wall Street to take away from this webinar? I would like to um, hopefully for future shareholders in the company to realize that we are very, um, very committed to getting the company profitable and being profitable and making a strong company for all the shareholders. Robert, do you want to answer as well? I think he said it very well. Yeah, it's all about building value. Perfect. Can you talk a little bit about why the stock has fallen so much? The company went through some very difficult times. We, um, for those of you who look back into um, you know the history of PCS, around 2007 is really where we had problems, and this was because of our commitment to the Middle East. We had a contract that uh, um, was executed with our vendor over there, and then things happened within the Ministry of Education, which is where we were going to deliver uh, Brick Labs, actually. It was a Brick Lab contract with licensed curriculum, and uh, the contract fell through um, at the Ministry of Education level. Unfortunately, after we had already announced that contract um, purchase order that we had executed with our vendor, this happened. So ultimately, we had to retract that information. Um, and from there, you know, it's been a long, hard road to get past that because a lot of people felt like maybe we weren't telling the truth. Well, we were. You can tell that we were actually doing business there because we're all over Saudi Arabia now. But things there take time. Um, relationships there are, they require patience. So that's really where the problem with the stock began. I think a lot of people lost confidence. Um, it was difficult to maintain operations in the face of a lot of the things that you know fell out of that particular issue. Um, so it's taken us a while to get back on our feet. Um, I took over as CEO in 2012, which is about when we cleaned up all of that. And over the past three years, um, with the help of the board and Todd, um, you know, we've rebuilt the company infrastructure, the products. Um, this quarter, we're spending an amazing amount of time developing infrastructure for product support and scaling fulfillment because of some of the relationships that, that we feel very confident about coming to fruition. So we feel we've turned the corner. It hasn't been easy. Um, that's where those 30 million shares went. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, one of the things that we teach in... Um, these labs, we call them again 21st century skills, but it's perseverance and it's learning by failure. Um, you have to be willing to take your lumps, you figure out what doesn't work, and you persevere, and the persistence is what will get you there. So you're asking that question to a company that doesn't give up, so hopefully that can give you a little bit of confidence in, in where we're going. Uh, you had a class action lawsuit in the past. Can you please talk about why that occurred? That was a bunch of ambulance chasing lawyers who hopped on the bandwagon after the SEC investigation was filed. Um, anybody who knows how these SEC inquiries go know that that's pretty much standard operating procedure. Um, one of these firms is going to tack on a um, shareholder lawsuit and try to collect some funds off it. So that's what happened there. That is all of the questions. Great. Any other um, questions from you, Ty, or anything else um, you'd like to? Oh, you know, we got one more. Yeah, they said thank you for all of your hard work, Robert. Ah, thank you. Oh, great. Um, yeah, if it, could we talk a little bit about uh, the drones? Um, we've got some drones that are coming right now from your engineer in China, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk about the capability of the, of these drones that are coming and? and some of the characteristics of them? Sure. You know, some of the things that, uh, for educational purposes, the drones have to have certain characteristics. One of those is flight time, so 20 to 30 minutes of flight time. 
Um, some of the high performance drones, some of the ones that we've been working with like this one, uh, they don't have enough flight time for you really to execute some of the you know, more advanced challenges that students need to do. Um, our advanced robotics curriculum that we developed, you know, which includes this rover, you know, the ground rover, actually works in conjunction with the drone at the higher levels where you actually have these things working in tandem. So you'll have a ground unit that's executing you know, um, a challenge and the drone will be following it and recording you know, information and streaming that back to the computer. You know, it's amazing what you can do with these things. They're capable of gathering all kinds of sensor data, so you can load them down with environmental sensors, things like temperature, um, uh, humidity, um, and then built-in accelerometers, compass, GPS, give you exact location, things like that. Uh, magnetometers you can use to actually pick up ore deposits in the ground. You can find out what, what is the mineral composition of the area you're flying over. There's just so many things you can do with them. It's, it's amazing. And we're looking at all of those as you know potential avenues for continuing to build up our drone curriculums and drone support, drone sales. How about ready to go out of the box? Uh, yeah, retail drone products um, for the regular person um, and actually go and compete with that market. Yeah, I mean, you, it seems that you have the, the knowledge, the understanding, and the. the the manufacturing to do so, right? Yeah, we're interested in looking at that. Uh, we haven't committed yet, but we certainly have the resources. Some of these materials that are coming in from China next week um, uh, will give us some indication as to how far we want to pursue that on the retail side. We are excited about you know retail robotics and pursuing the retail direct-to-consumer business because that's where a lot of our scalability comes from. Um, the institutional markets are very solid. You know, once you're into the schools and you're doing regular contracting with schools, it's very dependable. But the sales cycle on schools looks like a python that swallowed a pig. You know, all of that revenue comes in at a pretty concentrated quarter. What we want to do is continue to build out our retail offerings with things like robotics and drones that make our Q3, you know, boost. And then we also look at other things that we can do, which are things like subscription services and other recurring revenue models that will level out that um, revenue stream around the year. Throughout the year, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like that you've uh, got a pretty bright future ahead of you. Got some lessons learned from the past that got you to this point. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we continue with that growth. So Great. Yeah. Thanks good. for putting this together. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you guys for uh, for being here and, and tuning in. I know we went a little bit uh, long, we're about what, 45 minutes or so, but uh, hopefully we got all of your questions answered. And if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter at the Stock Doc. Um, also follow uh, PCS Adventures, PCS Adventures Lab. Um, you guys have an investor relations page mm -hmm. too at your yep. website. Yep, adventures.com slash investors. And you can join our mailing list. And yeah, get on their mailing list too. Um, that's that's something that's great. Uh, it's a lot like what uh, Transbyte had done uh, previously. So, um, yeah, appreciate you guys being here, and um, we will catch you on the next one. I'll probably be flying this thing, and we'll go from there. Okay, thanks. So long.